Hello and welcome back to the Star Trek Critic, where each episode is graded like a school project, starting with 100 points and then one point deducted for each error, such as plot holes, continuity errors, set design mistakes, star date mismatch, and anything else I can think of. In today's episode, Journey to Babel, Kirk hosts an alien Star Trek invention and meets Spock's parents. The first thing I want to ask is, why is Dr. McCoy getting dressed in Kirk's quarters? McCoy already knew this. That comment is really for the viewer. Kirk says, as soon as we get them aboard, we'll be able to relax. He'll regret saying that later tonight. This is important. He says there are 114 delegates aboard, which means the Enterprise has room for nearly 600 people if you include the crew. Now we're going to remember this in a later episode when Lieutenant Uhura has to give up her quarters. And the real truth of the matter is, the Starfleet crew probably spends more time shelling people around on missions like this than actually doing space exploration. And if Star's shuttle is landing in one minute, the honor guard should have been there an hour ago. Kirk is just freaking out right now. Looks like this security officer is making his move. They're using the shuttlecraft to show off the special effects. The first point is lost in this honor guard. There are just too many armed security guards on a mission that's supposed to be peaceful. They should have had a band or guards with flags. That would be better. Depressurizing is what they're going to do at the bar later tonight. Look closely, this is a Galileo 7, not a Vulcan or other Starfleet shuttlecraft. In a second, the guards will start stretching their sleeves. And look closely, there are two sets of doors leading into the shuttle bay. If they can put two sets of doors here, there should also be two sets of doors to the turbo lifts. So from now on, they'll be losing points. Spock shows the Vulcan salute to McCoy. And the next point is lost since both Spock and McCoy should be standing next to Kirk and not hiding in the hallway. I mean, they brought the whole honor guard. Here comes the standard diplomatic kissing up to each other, but Vulcans have a weird way of introducing their wives. How do you manage to hook up with Jane Wyatt? Minus one point for spelling hanger wrong. That's what Grammarly is for. Now is the time we learn in Vulcan culture it is perfectly logical to be stubborn and hold a grudge. Look closely, Sarek brought two Vulcan aides with them. Some people pick really strange places to flirt. And I will have to take a point for this since none of the delegates should be in the engineering section unescorted. Here's where Star Trek stumbles with scientific progress. Amanda complains Spock hasn't visited in four years. But if we have video chat today, they are sure to have it in the future, making it much easier for Spock to chat with his mother. This episode implies he hasn't talked to her at all. And she really has no right to talk. She didn't even go to his wedding. And minus one point since there are no engineers in engineering. Sorek is the one who's wrong here though, since Spock is still pursuing a career in the science field and actually did follow in his father's footsteps when it came to becoming a diplomat, so his father really did have a lot of influence on him. Minus one point for Kirk not knowing how to address Amanda. He's on a diplomatic mission. He should have looked it up. Amanda confides in Kirk of their difficulties, but what she really wants to ask him how come last week you didn't get my daughter the correct vaccinations and then left her on a planet to die, only to be possessed by a space cloud and engaged to an alcoholic womanizer that's been missing for 150 years? Amanda just says the Vulcan way is more logical, but doesn't give details on how their logic says being stubborn is the way to go. But Spock is trapped between two worlds and found his home in Starfleet. Aww. If Kirk watched Star Trek Enterprise, he'd know that Vulcans call themselves pacifists, so Starfleet will do all their dirty work. Shout out to Lieutenant Uhura for finding the secret signal. Communications officers are the unsung heroes of the military. Yes! Captain's log, Stardate 3842.4. This is the first Star Trek invention. I don't know who these guys are, but they should really use tongs instead of picking up stuff with their fingers. Look at that. We learn Vulcans live a lot longer. Here's a good shot of the mother and son. This is the first time we meet Tellarites and Andorians, two of the founding races of the United Federation of Planets. You really don't see much of them, which is too bad. Their robust personalities are perfect for Star Trek episodes. Personally, I think it would be great if we went back a hundred years in time to see how these four races got together. Well, never mind. Unfortunately, Enterprise got cancelled right about that time. There really is a reason Tellarites argue. It's because he has to hold his head back to see out of the mask. So, minus one point for a bad mask. Captain Kirk speaks like a diplomat when he says, Go do your petty bickering somewhere else. And he taught it to Captain Picard. It is a Starfleet tradition that at social gatherings, disputes are not permitted. I hereby declare, therefore, all disagreements resolved. The producers decide to appeal to their younger audience by making them believe you only eat candy in the future. 
minus one more point for the weekly Spock McCoy bickering. And right after Kirk said, no bickering. And pretty lame of McCoy to pry into Spock's personal life with his mother. And why does she describe the Salet as a giant teddy bear? Trouble on the bridge. And although Star Trek special effects were basic and budget constrained back then, an unknown ship that far away probably would look like this type of a light to them. So this ship is really just kind of stalking them. Kirk asks Spock to make a guess on what he thinks it is. Spock says, Vulcans never guess. And now Kirk is going to fire Spock for not guessing. Look at that, he's sassy for his ID. Now Kirk wants to sneak up on that ship and see what it's doing. But it, shouldn't they already be heading to Babel right now? Sark and Amanda quarrel over their son. And it turns out both of them love the movie The Empire Strikes Back. This is the Vulcan version of Umox. We know what comes next, which is why we're going to a new scene. The next point is lost since warp 10 in original Trek is a thousand times the speed of light, and that ship would be nowhere near them if it was going that fast. Screenshots of Uhura always turn out perfect. Starfleet says they don't know who it is. Now for round two. In this corner, the Tellarite. In this corner, the Vulcan. And on the side, the Andorians, who are secretly up to something. As you can see, Tellarites are very passionate about the 2020 election. A skirmish ensues, and Sarek's human fans erect a Vulcan statue of him in Birmingham, Alabama. This comment is why the Andorians stabbed him later. Gav threatens Sarek. Sarek says, threats are illogical. And then he threatens Gav back. Sometimes Vulcans are full of shit. Gav is now dead, and security is thinking, that's odd. I thought I was the one that's supposed to be killed. The killer left him in the hallway because he wants to frame Sarek. And this is sexist. Why can they show Kirk without his shirt on TV, but none of the women? I'm sure that would make the ratings go through the roof, don't you think so? Yes! There is more than one way to break a neck. And there are other Vulcans on the ship, including two of Sarek's aides. The only reason this was brought up was so Spock can say a Vulcan did it and suspect his father. And they said it in the hallway where everyone can hear. So minus one point for a bad plot device. Can you imagine how much that face is worth now? Kirk still can't get her name right. Of course we quickly learn that Sarek can be just as annoyingly logical and stubborn as Spock. And this is quite rude since he says private meditation is not to be discussed with Earthmen. Sarek avoids questions by faking a heart attack. So back on the bridge, Spock says the alien ship is composed of tri tri -tanium. Would that be six times the regular tanium, or nine times? Spock now has to annoy everyone with his logic. Of course the humans think it means to annoy him with even more emotional questions. They can't make the ship out, but again, Lieutenant Uhura makes the discovery. The signal is directed to someone on their ship. Spock can't decode the transmission, just like C-3PO. Sir, I am fluent in six million forms of communication. This signal is not used by the Alliance. It could... The next point is lost, since these scanners are sure to be able to find out what is wrong with his heart without surgery. He might need surgery to repair the problem, but there is no way these scanners of the future can find everything wrong with a person except for a Vulcan heart. Sarek now says he was having a heart attack instead of meditating. Talk about stubborn Vulcan pride. Instead of calling the doctor, Sarek lied. Of course, now they would suggest checking if the security cameras saw this happen. Amanda is pissed. He really hid his condition from her well, and his answer is no help at all. And both of them there look a little pissed. Check that out. And something tells me this surgery is impossible. Doesn't that mean a frozen open heart surgery? So minus one point. She doesn't believe it's real either. Minus one point for all the computer discs laying around. Of course, Sark has a rare blood type, and there are at least four Vulcans on the ship, but the one with the closest blood type is also half-human Spock. If McCoy's machine can take human components out of his blood, it should also be able to create a neutral Vulcan plasma. So minus one point for another bad plot device to create this unnecessarily long conversation. This is a rare shot of the actual science lab in operation. I don't think they ever call her Amanda. Now for the fight scene. And in this one, Kirk is actually stabbed with a knife. I'm sure the transporter checks for weapons, but he could have stolen it from the kitchen. Kirk walks sideways. That's because of his anti-gravity training. Kirk got a serious wound, and Spock spends an incredible amount of time explaining why he should be on the bridge instead of donating blood. So why is he here instead of on the bridge? Logically, he should have been on the bridge telling them this from the monitor, so minus one point. 
And here is his reasoning for the whole thing. The Andorian says he really doesn't know his aid. If McCoy wasn't so busy in sickbay, he could analyze him and discover the truth. And we learn about the Andorian's motives for murder. Here's a really good shot of the Enterprise. And Spock still hasn't made it to the bridge where he's supposed to be. This is why his mother slapped him. And we learn the Vulcan kids are racist towards mixed Vulcans. Another point is lost since the Andorian stabbed Kirk in his abdomen, but the bandage is across his chest. Even punctured his lung. I guess the stunt department didn't read the script. Kirk and McCoy con Spock into thinking it's okay to leave the bridge to get blood. Scotty, of course, never does make it to the bridge. The alien ship makes its move. Shout out to Lieutenant Uhura for being the unsung hero of this episode. She really does save the ship. Yes! You can barely see it, but there is green blood going through those tubes. One thing about Vulcans is their heart is on their right hand side, but McCoy is operating on Sarek's left hand side. Of course, there might be other reasons he is operating on the other side of Sarek. Besides the camera angle, of course. Of course, this is the last thing I want to hear my doctor say. They search him and find the hidden transponder. All thanks to Lieutenant Uhura's hard work. I already took a point for the other ship going too fast, but right now it's going at 500 times the speed of light and in its own warped space, so you would never see it. And you wouldn't be able to fire at it at all. And did anyone notice, McCoy only operates while the ship is under attack. While the crew throws themselves around to look like they're under attack, Jane Wyatt takes this chance to pose under the emergency light. He's not actually an Andorian, he's an Orion, and kind of a jerk, but he's on a one-way trip, so has no reason to be polite to anybody. And he can also do the battle dance. Kirk and the Andorian shout insults at each other. Kirk uses the age-old submarine tactic of plain dead, hoping the spy didn't watch the Star Trek episode Balance of Terror last year, or the movie Run Silent Run Deep. Even after 300 years, this trick still works. Here is the battle in a nutshell. The ship gets close enough for the Enterprise to disable it, but they were on orders to self-destruct instead. I would love to see the price tag for these basic special effects that were only on the screen for about 10 seconds. The Orion spy also held self-destruct orders, but he dies on the bridge before they can take him to sickbay and pump his stomach. And Chekhov is left in charge. In the final scene, Spock explains the motive. He and Sarek are now on logical speaking terms and now spouting logic to the point that it causes Amanda to sing a song. And logic, logic. I'm sick to death of logic. I doubt if Kirk will actually spend 10 days in sickbay. I mean, his quarters are only 100 feet away. And Dr. McCoy gets the last word and the show finishes in a traditional 1960s happy ending. So, no more petty bickering. Could you please continue the petty bickering? I find it most intriguing. So, who were the delegates? John Wheeler played Gav and has 70 screen credits to his name. William O'Connell played Thelov and has 60 screen credits to his name. Reggie Nalder played Shross, has 60 screen credits, and was the bartender in the original Battlestar Galactica pilot. Mark Leonard joined the Army for World War II, which led into his theatrical career. He has 60 screen credits to his name, including starring with Trek actor Robert Brown in Here Come the Brides. We saw him last year as a Romulan, and we'll see him again as a Klingon in the first Trek movie, and Sarek nine more times. And Jane Wyatt has 90 screen credits to her name, started in the 1930s, known most notably for her role in Father Knows Best with Eleanor Donahue. She received the Women's International Center's Living Legacy Award in 1986, the same time she was Amanda again in Star Trek IV. And the Tower of Babel, also known as the first Star Trek invention, gets a whopping score of 85%. Yes! And we all know I really should take a point for this guy, never telling this guy about his mother, or his father, or his older brother, or his human sister. But there are probably more surprise relatives coming in the future. One final shout out to Lieutenant Uhura for finding the signal. That's it for now. Thanks for viewing. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists. Check out that like button, the share button, and click that subscribe button. And I'll see you again soon.